everyone. Good evening and welcome to Hard Copy, the program where we bring you the people behind the news. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. My guest tonight is Ismail Ahmed, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Social Investment Programs and a member of the All Progressives Congress Board of Trustees. Ismail Ahmed, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you for having me. Well, it's good to have you here again. Where I think we had you in the early days yes. of this program when you were talking about <laughs> young people in politics. Yes. And now you're not only in politics, you've also been appointed to an office. Uh, how does it feel, that transition? Is there any uh, difference being just a politician and being in office and asked to do something? First of all, I don't think being a politician is being just a politician. I think it's a lot of work. <laughs> okay, if you say so. <laughs> I think it's a lot of work on its own because... Um, uh, it's the backroom legwork that gets you into office to do the government work. But yeah, the transition has been um, uh, being a politician and being in government office, uh, uh, two different things. Uh, but one gives you impetus and experience and uh, the ability to deal with people. And the position which I've been appointed into is a position that um, one of the cardinal principles of this administration, one of the biggest promises we've made on the campaign trail, uh, so it was, um, it was uh, some sort of a fit that I understood where we're coming from, the concept of the idea behind the social investment program from the campaign trail. And now being in an office and the ability to implement it, just the transition was, was, was very smooth. So, yeah. Well, you have actually pointed out the fact that this is one of your biggest campaign promises. Yes, it was. And you have accorded it a lot of priority, but mm -hmm. you're still far from the mark. I think it was just yesterday, mm -hmm. the vice president was talking about having fed 9.2 million children mm -hmm. and 500,000 people directly employed under the NPAR program. Right. But then your target is 24 million children to be fed under this uh, school feeding program. No. No, that's, what, that's what the target was at the moment it was launched in 2017. No, that was, uh, that was in the target. That was in the target. The target, as a matter of fact, we have gone across the target in terms of school feeding because our target was 5 million children. 5 million children? Absolutely. The target I read was 24 million children. I'm going to see if I can find... Um, yes, increase in school enrollment and completion. Nigeria currently has a primary school dropout rate of 30%. Well, there are a number of uh, targets here, you mm -hmm. know, which the program seeks to achieve. Yeah. But, you know, 24 million, it would seem, was the initial figure. Maybe no, it's been revised. No, no, no. Certainly, the term, in terms of school feeding, mm -hmm. our initial target was about 5 million children. To feed 5 million children, we have surpassed our target since last year. We are now in 9.2 million, 9 million children we're feeding daily uh, on the school days in about 49,000 schools across the country in about 26 states right now. We just added Adama and Sokoto states. But how practical was that? If indeed the idea was to enroll just 5 million children in schools and, and, or, or get them to feed 5 million mm. children in schools mm. and we understand that Nigeria has a dropout rate or uh, children on the streets of t about 10 million, mm. uh, was that really a very feasible plan? It was, I think, because it has increased school enrollment, just like you mentioned. Um, and uh, it has uh, improved the nutrition of formative age of children between uh, primaries one to three. Um, and, and, and I can tell you this for, for a fact because it's something I've gone on the field and I have seen. And I have seen that, you know, as much as when, when we move into a state, for example, and we start feeding them in public primary schools, uh, children start coming back, parents start dropping their children back into school instead of taking them to farms or uh, hawking, uh, petty trading uh, or whatever. And then the numbers increase. So we cannot designate and say, well, we are going to cut off. This is, this is what we have to do. The, the agreement with schools is that once we have schools, once we have children in schools that are, uh, is real, is genuine, we, have, we can verify the numbers. We have sent out the numerators to make sure that we verify the number of the pupils. Uh, we move in and then we feed. So, mm. so it has not only improved, uh, you know, school enrollment, enrollment, school enrollment mm -hmm. which, which is a very big plus. And I think last year or something, early this year or something like that, there was a director in the Ministry of Education that was talking about it. In one of the states, in one of the seminars that he attended, I think about two million more children that were out of school now are in school as a result of the school feeding. So it's a direct kind of like ecosystem that happens. First of all, you have you create an agricultural revolution from the bottom up in the sense that it's a homegrown school feeding, which means that we feed from what is grown at home, especially in the communities where the schools are located. It is being cooked by women who are 
within the vicinity of the school. So usually those are the mothers of the children that go to that school. And then the food stuff and the food materials are being bought by local, from local farmers. So we have a situation where he thought to where we have farmers who were into subsistence farming, for example, just basically to feed themselves, are now into some sort of a semi-commercial farming because they have cooks to sell their food stuff to, so they're doing a bit more larger quantity. That mm. has increased agricultural involvement of people at the local level. Now the farmer, the women buy the, the food stuff from those farmers and they cook for the kids in school. So you have a complete ecosystem of where you have the farmers selling their foods and the cooks cooking, they get paid and their children being fed. All of which is very laudable. I mean, some people will say when you look at the program on, it, on its merit, you, it's very, very difficult to fault it. But when you look at how it's been implemented, there are questions raised. There are questions as to, first and foremost, the figure, the amount that has been earmarked to actually feed a child. How frequently this money is coming? In recent times, I've heard cooks complain that their monies don't come in as frequently as they ought to. And so you find that they have to stop on certain days or sometimes for weeks at a time until their money is coming. I'm sure you heard some of those things, haven't you? Yes, we have. And then there are questions as to, uh, you know, how this is actually being, you know, inculcated or how the education part of it is being implemented alongside the school feeding program. Because we have also heard situations where the children actually come to school, they get to eat the food, and after food, they go home. <laughs> Haven't you heard that? Well, I think that's a marginal issue, to be quite honest. Uh, the fact, let me address the issue of the school, the children coming to eat and then go. Um, I, I haven't heard, we haven't had that as a report yet. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've heard conversations like that that have happened a couple of few places. And um, ultimately, you know, we have to do our part as federal government. Our fed as federal government, uh, primary education is not directly our responsibility to start with. It's the responsibility of states and local governments. Now, this is an intervention program to help the state and local government do their own part of their responsibility, which means to make sure that they fix the infrastructural decays that are happening in the schools, to make sure that they pay the, they pay the teachers well. Some of their complaints have usually been that well, we have no pupils. The children simply don't want to go to school. Well, now they want to go to school. Now they are being fed. Do the rest. So there is a lot of things that need to go on to have, to get us to where we want to be in terms of primary education. UBEC is doing its own part. I know a lot of states are doing their own part as well. We are intervening in terms of school feeding to improve nutrition and get school enrollment. Uh, the other partners, which means states and local governments, will have to do their own part, and we're encouraging them to do their own part. No one... No one is saying this is a perfect way of doing this. But it's a far, far, far improvement from where we used to be five, three, four years ago, which about 10 million children out of school. Now we have 8 million. That is a good, good improvement, mm -hmm. no matter how you look at it. On the issue of um, uh, cooks not being paid, we have budgetary constraints in almost all sectors of the economy or the polity. Uh, but I will tell you this for free, that government has given social investment and school feeding a priority. We have done an incredible, incredible way of uh, getting things where we want more. We want the monies to come more frequently and more forcefully and be more available at any time we need it. Absolutely, yes.